introduce Ryan while he is standing right beside me getting all set up. Ryan is the co-founder and CTO of both ClearPath Robotics and Auto Motors, based in Kitchener, Ontario. He serves on the board of the NSERC Canadian Robotics Network, Open Robotics, and is co-founder of ROSCON, an international developers conference for ROS, the open source robot operating system software platform. Ryan is also an advisor to several startups and venture capital groups and helped found the Next Generation Manufacturing Canada Initiative. He is a regular speaker, panelist, and expert guest on topics including robotics, AI, and technology policy, and also has more than 50, 50 pending patents in the field of intelligent systems. So once Ryan gives me the okay, we will kick things off. And uh, you all set? We're all good. All right. So please join me in welcoming Ryan. Thanks, everyone. And uh, thank you very much to uh, Josh and the rest of the Ingenuity Labs team for having me here. Um, also, I'll just apologize to everyone watching this live stream in advance. After two years of being told that I need to wear shirts that just look good on camera, solid colors, no stripes, no patterns, I decided that since it was very clear that we we're going to have an in-person conference here, I was going to wear one of the stripiest shirts I own. So no offense to the camera people. Anyway, um, just maybe before I get started a little bit, uh, a little um, a little bit of history almost with of, of our relationship with, with Queen's University. Um, Josh was actually one of our first customers um, at the company at, in the, just in general, I think in, uh, I came and visited with one of our first high price salespeople who did not work out, um, but I, I stuck around obviously, and uh, came and visited and, and heard all of his ideas for autonomous mining and discussions about how it was so hard to find rugged machines that you could do, uh, that you could do actual real world research in because he wasn't, uh, he wasn't uh, content to have his, to have your, his grad students at the time, just, you know, play with MATLAB which I know these days it's all about getting your robots out into the real world, but uh, people like Josh were some of the first to really advocate that this is part of research. And I think we actually had lunch at the grad hall, like right down the street there. I don't know if that's still open, but the grad club. And uh, this is a much nicer office and setup than you used to have. But I think uh, I think that's that's been something we've seen, We or I, I entered the industry, you know, well, founded ClearPath 13 years ago, and we'll just say that things have, have gone uh, pretty well for the industry as a whole. Um, but I'll, um, maybe that's a good run up into the topic at hand here. I'm talking about uh, changing the world with robots, which I think we all want to do. We all see the potential for, um, but without a PhD. So first, can you raise your hands if you have a PhD or on track to get a PhD or anything like that? You can raise your hands, it's okay. Um, no offense. <laughs> um, I, 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 don't want, I don't have one, but... Um, but the reason I, I want to bring this forward is actually not that that having a PhD is a bad thing. It's it's really really it's really great. It's the sort of thing that's made this this industry possible. And I think having that degree of academia in in a new startup in a new business um, business endeavor is critical. But we also need to make sure that we see how the world is changing. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll do the obligatory step back a long way. Um, early days of robots. So some people don't realize that uh, the drones, the drones that you're now seeing under the Christmas tree aren't, aren't the new ideas that go back even to the 2000s or, you know, to companies like Arion and, and Dragonfly or the first flight of a television guided drone was actually in 1942 with uh, World War II. And likewise, the first robot used in a GM factory predated the invention of the integrated chip. So we're all very much standing on the shoulders of giants here. Um, Likewise, I know that the pundits on the self-driving car industry, particularly those who have an ax to grind at Waymo or Tesla or what have you, are really fond of pointing out that the first car to drive autonomously on the Autobahn was in 1987. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a while. These things have been, you know, iterating. We've got these, you know, these overnight successes 40 years in the making. Uh, and likewise, auto landing, you know, relatively full-size drones, were, that was something that was possible in 91. So we keep... You know, things keep going, but um, it started to get really exciting in about the early 2000s when you started to see some of these other companies that are now household names start to emerge. So um, Amazon Robotics, previously known as Kiva Systems, previously known as Distrobot, was founded in about 2003. 
Um, and I think Raf has history with this. Did he do his PhD here or undergrad? Oh, pardon? We were together. Yeah, okay. So Josh and Josh and Raf were together at, um, at U of T. Raf was one of the founders of Amazon Robotics. Uh, Universal Robots from Odin's Denmark, uh, founded in 2005, and DJI, you know, famous drone company, founded in 2006. And at the time, I think all they did made was IMUs. But then the world starts to uh, wake up, I think, around the, the early... The early 2010s is when the media starts to cap, starts to see the potential here, when this starts to be within the public eye, possibly most importantly for companies like ourselves, when investors start to care. So 2012, that's when uh, Google unveils Project Chauffeur, which was their self-driving car project, what it was called at the time. 2013, um, Boston Dynamics unveils Atlas. So the thing that is now doing all the fancy parkour, it only got unveiled uh, just... Um, you know, just over uh, just over nine years ago. Now, obviously, Boston Dynamics themselves has a 30 year history, but all of that fancy stuff is less than a decade old. And then you have other companies which are, we'll just say less well-funded, but started to just come out of nowhere, almost like the Zipline, which is a, a drone company that did, did beyond visual line of sight drones for delivering uh, medical supplies, um, primarily in Africa. And now they've expanded from here. So. This and, you know, we were founded in 2009. So around this time was when we were starting to see a pickup, when we were starting to see researchers and investors start to realize that there was actually potential here, that this wasn't just a science project. And now this is where we are. Everyone, you know, obligatory. Most of these are our robots, but, you know, I'm presenting and no one else is. Um, but there, there is there's a huge amount of interest here just across the board. We've got, you know, our robots have been doing very, very well in factory and warehousing, but most recently we did you know, announce that one of our robots is running autonomously surveying penguins in Antarctica. Um, no robot PhDs there, unfortunately. If you want to go, I'm sure you can figure it out. But, um, you know, agriculture, manufacturing, uh, social, um, uh, social work now is another topic which is being more and more actually invested in it. Again, not just research. And then also in the lower right, we're seeing this really interesting industry, which we'll see, we'll see if it lives up to the hype. Um, you know, personal, personal electric flying vehicles, right? It's a brand new industry, but it's only that industry only exists. I mean, it might be a pipe dream, but it only exists even as a pipe dream because of robotics, because of the progress we've had in drones and autonomous systems. So there's just, we're just right on the, we're just right on the starting point here. Like the you know, there's probably a fraction of a fraction of a percent of problems which can be solved by robotics, which are presently being solved by robotics. So I'll skip through this one pretty quickly because you've all seen, um, you've all seen topics and present presentations like this. Uh, I'm going to start by getting this statement out of the world, out of the way right now. Um, everyone likes to debate this. This is the current definition of robot that I'm working with. You know, you can debate me on this after if you'd like, but just so we're all level set on my definition, this is where I'm starting with. And again, I have the microphone. All right, so do I have videos playing now? Okay, I'll just start two videos. Okay, so here's some, I think there's two probably running or zero. Oh, here we are. So, you know, I'm just showing some obligatory robot videos. This is all running out of the automotive software that we have. Um, oh, and play fancy AV is fancy. Okay. Maybe next time we need to move the thing. All right. Anyway, if that plays or not. Oh, no, that's an error. Okay. Um, anyway, there's, you know, you've all seen videos of robots doing mapping, robots doing navigation, fancy videos coming out of any number of startups, some of which are vaporware, some of which are not. And people like to look at this and say, this is the fundamentals of robots. And am I really going to continue? Are my slides advancing? Okay. And even more videos. These ones are loading. Excellent. So again, here's here's just some more obligatory videos from our tech stack because I don't get to do these presentations without showing them. Um, these are just, again, the robot's eye view of what's going on inside our robots. And this is, again, the same sort of stuff that you see on you know Tesla videos, 
And wait, oh, thank you very much. That's, that's immensely helpful. Thank you. Um, oh, that's helpful. There we go. Um, again, the same sort of videos that you see from innumerable startups and large corporations saying, look at all this cool stuff we're doing. This is obviously, this is intelligence. This is what you need to build a robot. And unfortunately, I usually find that those people are the ones who have never actually deployed a robot in the real world in their life. Um, because again, to come back to our architecture, what I've just highlighted, which fancy as it is right now, is just actually a subset of what sits on our actual robot. And then, you know, you start to realize this when you get into things like actually putting the robots into the real world. Um, you don't need to do runtime management or version and configuration management if there's just 20 if there's just 20 robots out in the world each of which has a safety driver and an army of engineers looking over them right like to use one example the it was publicly announced not too long ago that the the cruise uh, business unit of gm the autonomous driving business unit of gm spends five million dollars us per day like when you do that you can spend a lot of time not solving these problems but when you if you really want your robots to go out there in the real world to do a lot of good work, you need to solve all of these problems. And not just those problems, even that box itself falls into the stack of everything you need to build a robot. Like you need simulation and testing, you need fleet management, you need to be able to write apps for your robot. You need to have a, a spectrum of vehicles and supporting hardware. That's all of this stuff you need to really solve to build the robot. And I'm, not actually saying, you know, you all have ideas about what to do with robots, we should all pack up, go home, unless you can raise a hundred million dollars. That's that's not the case. Um, but let's, so let's just look at the progress. 10 years ago, if we wanted to look at the stack of what you needed to do the robots, you basically needed to do everything yourself. Uh, I know this from personal experience because we did do everything ourselves. I mean, we use Ross and Ubuntu and a few things like that, but, you know, you had Gazebo for simulation, you had some data collection options. There was Ross and Ubuntu for operating systems. You had vehicles at that time. Well, I'm gonna highlight us. We are at least selling, you know, ClearPath, Adept, Robotnik. There were a few vehicles out there and you had some sensors that worked. But now you have the, you really wanna solve the problems. This is the good news. This is the good news is that now there's so much stuff that you can work with that you do not need to reinvent the wheel on that you can um, that you can you can build from. You can avoid having to learn about simulation and testing or fleet management or building apps for your robots or or starting with your own vehicle. All of this stuff is out there. So whether you're a grad student, whether you're a uh, whether you're a professional running a research lab, whether you're starting a startup, you really can start with so many options here. Um, and uh, just for Luke, I think I saw you out here. Um, I did credit Agilex. I didn't throw Indro on there, but Agilex is at least there. So no one can say I'm not um, biased here. And so at this point, I figured, you know, let's actually go through some tips. So you've got all of this stuff here. I figured I would go through a few different tips. Again, assuming that at some point, some of you in your lives will want to do something with robots. Um, or actually possibly build a product, whether that product is something that you wanna make money off or whether it's a hobby, I figured I'd just go through a few tips on things I've seen some companies do right and some things I've seen that some companies do wrong um, on doing so. So the first one, and I don't know how many of you have a background in startups or business analysis or anything like that, but everyone talks about, you know, when you want to start a business, when you start want to start a product, you always want to start with your total addressable market. Pick something with your, your biggest total addressable market possible. Everyone talks about that. And this is a little cringe, but still, no, we do not want the total addressable market. We want some, you want to select on the, on the, on the basis of what's called your operational design domain. Um, operational design domain, which I'll, I'll get into, but the reason for that is because in almost any case you can apply robots, the total addressable market is already in the billions of dollars. So don't get greedy by trying to pick, you know, the $5 billion problem to solve instead of the $1 billion problem to solve. Start by just making it easy on yourself. So operational design domain, where you deploy, where the robots are deployed, in what situations, not just the environment, but in the regulatory case, in how it works with the world. So here's a good first example. Passenger cars. Everyone loves passenger cars, passenger cars. Um, 
I'd say everyone loves the idea of autonomous passenger cars, possibly except for the pension funds, which have, I think there's been a count that says that $100 billion has been poured into autonomous driving companies, which have produced almost zero economic value. Yay. And this is why. Because it's very, very hard. You're going from nothing to trying to handle something in all climates and un all weather, unstructured problems, systems that need to move at upwards of 30, 40 meters per second to react at over 1G of acceleration or deceleration. You're working with people who don't know anything about robots and dealing with an undeveloped and inconsistent regulatory environment. This is going to fail, right? It's This is it's jumping into passenger cars from barely any robots going out in the world is like saying, oh, look, we built the 8086 processor. Um, now let's just start running like let's let's just write the unreal engine next like there's there's a few different stages there or it's to say we've got the you know we've got the you know the the motorola star tag well obviously the next the next thing to build is google maps right there's there's a few different middle um middle steps along the way and now i'll say i'm very thankful for all the investment money that went into passenger cars because the downstream positive impacts have helped us a great deal and i'm sure have helped many of your research grants a great deal but let's be realistic here um you know let them spend the money don't spend your money on this now I'll look at a uh, I'll look at where we are on the automotive side, factory material transport. You can see there are still some challenges, right? We are operating in a highly dynamic semi-structured environment, but your climate and weather are heavily controlled. There's minimal training and user in, uh, awareness required. For example, we can basically assume that everyone working in around our robots is an adult of you know reasonable cognitive proficiency who can walk who wears steel toe shoes we can make these assumptions and believe me these assumptions matter a great deal and also sometimes which comes up a lot the uh, regulatory environment is is well defined and consistent which is which is great like this makes things easy so as we go and scale where we've i worked out that um, from a capital efficiency perspective our company is actually four orders of magnitude more capital efficient than waymo um, we have over three i think we're at four million hours of unsupervised autonomous operation in factories right now and it's because we picked the game properly now we've done a lot of great work to get there but if we had started by saying you know a small canadian company was going to go and, and work on the road like operate in general environment we wouldn't have done this uh, the other thing i'd call out and again this is again for the uh for the audience like this is where the without a phd comes in here is that the first three challenges are definitely autonomy challenges autonomy and systems engineering and safety engineering challenges the other four challenges are other challenges their business challenges, their user experience challenges, their product design questions. There's all sorts of questions here, which gets you other challenges to face. This one, I just, you know, shamelessly adopted Kernigan's law here that site integration is twice as hard as building the robot in the first place, putting it actually in the site. Therefore, if you build the robot as cleverly as possible, you are by definition not smart enough to actually deploy it. Um, which I found has has worked out well. If you give it so many different dials and knobs and ability to compensate for the environment, and then you hand it off to someone who has never ever worked with a robot before, it usually goes poorly. The, the next thing that people often miss is that value hypothesis, avoiding the problem with the avoiding searching for a problem that your solution solves, building a solution in search of a problem. So these are these are actually some videos of our systems deployed. Uh, the one on the left is actually from 2018. The one on the right, I think that video is 2021. So you see that these are customers who are willing to say, maybe the customers aren't willing to say. Okay. Um, anyway, there's videos of robots driving around, but those customers are willing to talk about clear reasons to adopt the robots, right? There's not, be, there's no statement about we did this because of corporate innovation, or we did this because of industry 4.0. On the left, they did this because they thought that they would get, and they did get $250,000 US in savings. And they were able to take the people that they would, that they were struggling to hire, just live, oh, Oh, just moving boxes around, they were able to take those people and redeploy them to forklift drivers and manufacturing operators. 
And the other benefit here was because all of the robots were doing the handoffs between different locations, this plant of all the different companies here, this, oh, okay, this is very global. I'm now able to talk about that one. Um, they were the most profitable and least impacted by labor shortages and sanitization through the entire pandemic. Because if all you're doing is you're having robots pass things around, it works. Now, if you think through COVID, a lot of people were talking about this being a hypothesis that, oh, if we can have robots transfer material, you know, it'll make everything safer. Like only if, only if that was the case. This plant was deployed in 2018. So it, it, it was true and it was real and it, it does work. And then likewise, this other one, it looks like actually a very, if, if the video will go through the entire thing, it looks like a very expensive use of a robot to just move things um, literally from one side of an aisle to the other until you think through the alternatives. The alternatives of moving things from one side of the aisle to the other is an overhead conveyor because you can't block traffic or to have a forklift on standby, just moving these giant pallets back and forth. So as much as it can seem very complicated and expensive to have a robot there, the alternative is to have a person literally sitting there somewhere um, moving things back and forth. So again, it's not always about the big flashy operation. Sometimes there's a lot of both money and societal benefit to be had um, with the simple things. So, you know, don't overthink things. Then we get to the business model hypothesis. Like, how do you get your stuff out in the world? This is a very simple example. Um, Queens occasionally pays us money and we deliver robots. And then we pay money to our parts suppliers and they give us parts with which we build robots. This is almost one of the simplest examples you can use. And I use this not because people aren't smart enough to get that this is how it works, but because it's usually not this simple. So if I use auto, our other division, this is kind of where we started. And then we said, oh, wait, um, there's a bunch of distributors and systems integrators out in the world that we need to work with um, for a variety of reasons. And then we said, nope, actually, that's getting really expensive to deal with all of them. So we need to deal with dealerships. We need to deal with strategic integrators. And we need to deal with end users directly for all of these reasons. So now this gets really complicated. And then we're in the situation where, well, we can only deal with strategic end users in North America um, because none of us can speak Japanese um, and we don't have established relationships at that level. So it goes from just sell to an end user all the way to this relatively complex mess that comes into how you sell. And again, this, this might seem as this business, you know, just one of these random business things, which is just easy if you, if you think about it long enough, you also start to realize that everyone in those categories is paid on some sort of commission. They're incented to do some of this work. And what happens when you find a strategic end user that needs to be sold to by a systems integrator and you possibly also want a dealership to support them. Now, are you paying three times the commission because you just lost all your money? Um, these are those sorts of dynamics and interesting things that start to imagine that start to emerge, like understanding where you fit in the world, because if you're solving a real problem, these people have already brought tools to solve this problem in the past. And likewise, understanding the ecosystem on which you, in, in which you fit. So this complicated mesh of things is generally the way industrial equipment gets built and customized for factories and warehouses globally. There's all these people, some of which these companies have existed for literally 200. So I think the record of company I've talked to, they're 400 years old, and they are now building some of this technology. And they have built their own relationship over decades and in some cases, centuries. And you can't just walk in and say, I have a robot and we'll solve all your problems. Um, First, you're usually wrong. Second, it's also useful to have some of them on your side. Um, so for example, we decided that we are going to drop ourselves right in there, um, which is nice because you wind up understanding, you wanna partner with as many, you wanna partner with as many people as possible, right? The fact, like if I look at some of our strategic partners, we have, um, we have some of the largest forklift dealers in the world who are selling our products. Uh, Siemens is a strategic partner of ours. Honeywell is a strategic partner of ours. There's tons of these companies which are strategic partners and are multinationals. And then that is already layered on the top of, you know, companies like SICK and Velodyne and Kinova. And part of that is understanding where you fit, because if you can understand where you fit, then you can partner with them and work with them. And if you say you're going to do everything, then you've just decided to compete with everybody, which these days, you know, this, is, this isn't the EV revolution. All of these large companies have also woken up and figured out that robots are a big thing. So work with them, right? Understand how you'd work with them. 
I'm just going to keep ranting about the partnership thing because it is a big problem I see with robot companies. Um, the other thing, uh, which is which is related here, is you know this is a a nice ramp of a development team, right? There's three or four of you start something off, build some cool stuff. Over time, you've now a 16 person development team, right? You can imagine what it's like to have three people, if you've ever worked in a group project before, which I think most of you had, to go from like three people, really smart, working on a group project, you know, let's multiply that by a factor of five. You're gonna get a ton of stuff done, right? Now, I'm not even gonna, I'm not even going to offend you by asking you to raise your hands or whatever, because it's obvious this is a trick question. Um, this is actually what happens over time. Uh, if you look at those people who are doing all the fun R&D stuff, let's say three people, you see as you stack up all the other things you do when you're building a company and deploying your product into the real world, you know, building integrations because your customers said, if you don't talk to this or you don't have this feature or you don't have this interface, we won't talk to you. Building a new feature because the salespeople said you needed that to close a deal. Doing sustaining engineering once you start to launch your products and your, your products just can't be shut down because you're, that would offend your customers. And then you start getting overhead because you're running an actual company now. You actually wind up with your R&D, despite the fact that your team size has just gone up by a factor of five, your available R&D capacity has dropped by a factor of three. Like it's been, like you've actually got 10%, less than 10% of your team is now working on that fundamental R&D. And I say this because there, I've seen with a lot of robotic startups, they have this perception of, well, we've, we've got a lot of great stuff done with six people. Let's go raise venture capital and we can do five times as much innovative stuff. Therefore, we can continue to build all our own stuff as well. That, that doesn't actually work. You have companies as large as, uh, what was one example? Uh, 3D Robotics, um, big drone company. They raised a lot of money, I think $100 million. They went off, they built everything themselves, all the way down to motor controllers and operating system, like custom operating system, everything. Um, and then they folded. Because it turns out that when you start to launch products into the real world, you have a lot of other things that start to demand your time. And I'll actually use a, a very real example here. This is, eh, I'm just gonna say reasonably realistic data. It, it's somewhere between 2019 and now, but we haven't changed that much ratio wise. So this is actually a snapshot of our team. 95% uh, of the people at our company do not have a background in autonomous systems, like do not have a graduate degree or something like that in autonomous systems. We do now, we have a 14, now 20 people I think who do, and it's great, we're starting to publish, we're doing a bunch of research, that's very exciting, but we are 13 years in. Right, we are 13 years in, we're starting to get a sense of what's going on here. But even engineering, 58% uh, of the company does things that are not strictly product engineering. It's not to say that there aren't engineers elsewhere, like our uh, three of our four, you know, C-suite, if you will, are, are engineers, majority of our management are engineers, but when it comes down to what they do, you know, 58% of people, including myself, are not actually doing development work. And this is something that also adds on, you know, how you build this company, how you plan and how you attract people and talent is realizing that to actually sell and to, to really make a difference, you wind up with all of this, you know, all of this, um, this mix of people, which can be, you know, once, once you do, once, once you can build a team like this, as we have, it's honestly very inspiring because things like that sales problem that I mentioned I know it's a problem because we have people who have done this before just going off and solving the problem. I don't need to worry about it, but I can actually learn from it. Learn from it enough that I can speak relatively authoritatively in front of you. And then it really comes down again to that slide that I put up earlier, um, which is to partner where possible, to realize that your costs are going to do this, that you're going to have very real loads when you start to go off into the real world. So to say things like, you know what, maybe I don't need to build a vehicle myself, hint, hint. Um, <laughs> um, maybe, uh, you know, maybe I don't need the robot intelligence myself. I need indoor robotics, or if I need indo, um, indo, um, indoor autonomy, indoor intelligence, well, you know, we sell that. I mean, you don't need to buy from us. There's other companies that sell it. I put their names up there, but you know, we sell that. There's companies who do, there's all sorts of ways to do operating systems. So if someone starts coming to you and saying, well, we need an ultra secure operating system, or we need an operating system, hypothetically that's secured to, or that's certified to ISO 26262, which is an automotive safety standard, you know, go call up apex.ai, don't build it yourself. If you wanna do simulation, well, there's all sorts of companies that are starting to do this simulation stuff. I should probably put NVIDIA on there. 
Um, sorry to the NVIDIA team when you see this. Um, but there's all sorts of companies which will happily take your money and give you a fully kitted out simulation that you can work with. And this is really what I think it's important to start with. Like realize, focus on the innovation. Like what is your one innovation? Um, focus on it. And then for everything else, just partner. And I say this not as someone who really cares about you know, selling yet another Husky. Hironi's here, if you want that. Um, but um, but it's really from someone who's done this for 13 years. Um, we've spent probably $100 million over that 13 years building this, what I believe to be groundbreaking technology. But as a founder, it's it's very rough. Like it's, there's a lot of stress, there's a lot of learning and this stuff will make things easier. Um, and the other thing is, is that even if you could spend that same amount of money and we're in the same position that we were 13 years ago, you also have the challenge, which is honestly companies like us who are also doing the same thing, right? We have 13 years to build on. We have, there's all sorts of other companies which are out there starting from where they are right now. So if you want to innovate, you got to be very, very specific, right? Google wasn't started. Google didn't start by saying, we're going to do search and street view and email you know, and this and that and translation and maps and all these other things. They started with one thing, which was search, right? That's the sort of thing you want to, you want to approach this as because we are entering this new world. And then finally, I love to throw this in front of, uh, in, in front of uh, robotics companies in particular. Um, I started talking about this at ICRA in 2019. And unfortunately, I still have to keep talking about it, which is all the people who say it doesn't matter. We don't need to do market development. We don't need to do all of this stuff because we are a platform. Uh, that is unfortunately not a cheat code to skip anything I've said before. Um, it also implies that platform strategies are new. Uh, it turns out platform strategies are not. There are entire textbooks literal textbooks on product strategy, which have chapters dedicated to this. You know, people started developing platform strategies, you know, in the 1900s. Standard Oil was technically a platform. Disney is a platform. There's all sorts of things that you can work with here. And then everyone turns around and says, well, what about the iPhone? What about the App Store? And again, now I'm just kind of setting up straw men and knocking them down. But the iPhone released in, in June 2007. Before they released the App Store, they sold 5.5 million phones. So if you go out and sell even a small fraction of that amount of robots, then yes, you can start rolling out a platform. But this is very important to really figure out what to get your robots into all of these people's hands and then really start investing in the platform. I mean, if you're raising money, you can put it as a throwaway slide in one of your, in one of your investor decks, but really it's all about focusing on how you're gonna help people, how you're gonna deliver value. Yes. Ooh. So uh, I think that's, that's kind of closing off. So hopefully these, you know, to summarize those six points for if you are, hopefully you are wanting to make a difference out in the real world at some point with robotics. Uh, here are these, again, these six points I've seen some people fall down on and hopefully it's been helpful for everyone. And with that, uh, thank you very much. And I don't know if I have time for questions. I do have time for questions. Excellent, thank you.